thank you, Michael, and thank you to everybody for coming this evening. Um, I'm going to start the lecture this evening, and there you see the artful dodger um, and Oliver Twist, archetypal representations of child criminals, with an anecdote. I was uh, travelling on a bus going into Brighton not so long ago, and behind me were two parents. And the subject of their conversation was whether their two children, who were in the final year of primary school, should be allowed to venture into Brighton by themselves. And the parents very quickly came to the conclusion that these children were too young to be trusted to be out in Brighton by themselves. I was very tempted to turn round and join in the conversation. <laughs> but um, you'll be pleased to know that I restrained myself and didn't point out, given that they'd decided that it was uh, unwise for their children to be let loose in Brighton, that had they permitted their children to go into Brighton and had something gone wrong, that those children would have been deemed responsible in criminal law for any offences they committed. And that's the topic of my lecture today. Those children would have been six years away from being old enough to buy a pet for themselves. They would have been four years away from being able to do a paper round, and six years away to be from being able to enter into a sexual relationship, which actually includes kissing. And yet, the criminal law of England and Wales deems these 10-year-olds responsible enough to be taken before a criminal court if they commit an offence. Now, it's not the purpose of this lecture to argue that all such legal inconsistencies, all such different thresholds are per se unjustifiable. But I do argue that such inconsistencies do have to be justified. And I will argue that the current law of England and Wales, with a very low age of criminal responsibility at 10, is unjustifiable. In arguing this, I'm in good company. The United Nations Convention for the Rights of the Child, the Committee of the Rights of the Child, the Children's Commissioner for England and Wales, Children's Charities, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, all agree that the age of criminal responsibility in our jurisdiction is unusually low. Currently going through Parliament is a private member's bill which attempts to raise the age of criminal responsibility. It has, sadly, very little chance of becoming law. But to set the scene for my lecture, I'm just going to re uh, a quote from Lord uh, de Lapierre's opening statement in Parliament. He is the sponsor for this private member's bill. Just last month, he had this to say. It cannot be right to deal with such young children in a criminal process based on ideas of culpability which assume a capacity for mature, adult-like decision-making. There is no other area of law, whether it's the age for buying a pet, the age for paid employment, the age of consent to sexual activity, or the age for smoking and drinking where we regard children as fully competent to take informed decisions until later in adolescence. The age of criminal responsibility is an anomalous exception. So my purpose today is to explain why it cannot be right to deal with such young children in a criminal justice system which is based on ideas of culpability. To do this, I'm going to be exploring a number of different concepts. And in the time available, 
you'll forgive me if some of these are briefly painted rather than dealt with in detail. So, childhood, responsibility, and then how that interrelates with child development. Childhood, then. It's commonplace today to say that childhood is a construct. It's not a natural state. It's a complex construction, and it changes over time and has different understandings in different cultures. It's also clear that there are different constructions of childhood which operate in non-legal disciplines and within law itself. None of this is unjustifiable per se. But what does matter is that these different constructions um, can appear to be coherent in the way that they operate. So I'm going to expand upon this a little bit by looking at the constructions which operate in two different areas of law. First, family law, and then the criminal law. If we think of criminal law, uh, sorry, if we think of family law first then, it's very clear that underpinning the law is a developmental construction of childhood. The child is seen as unfinished or becoming. This approach may well be influenced by the work of Locke and his portrayal of a child as a blank canvas upon which everything is subsequently written. A child is seen as vulnerable, dependent, in need of protection, the child may also be seen as incompetent in legal terms and his or her welfare will be the focus of concern. And as the child develops, so this concept of dependency and vulnerability may be replaced by one of autonomy. Now, the developmental construct of childhood which, which underpins family law has been subject to very considerable criticism, but it has been highly influential. Indeed, it's at the core of traditional philosophical thinking about childhood as a necessary preparation for an indication of what will follow in adulthood. It's also found expression in law in terms of the welfare principle and the test of Gillick competence. So a child of 10, for example, may well in family law have his or her view taken into account, but if it's an issue of importance, it's extremely unlikely that that view would be regarded as in any way decisive of the matter. Representative of this view of the child is this statement by Lord Bingham. It was in a case about whether a child could have an independent legal representative. A child is, after all, a child. The reason why the law is particularly solicitous in protecting the interests of children is that they are liable to be vulnerable and impressionable, lacking the maturity to weigh the longer term against the shorter, lacking the insight to know how they will react and the imagination to know how others will react in certain situations lacking the experience to match the probable against the possible. Now that's a statement that has been repeated many times over in family cases. It's very, very rare that you'll find it being expressed in a criminal case. So let's turn to the criminal law. The construct of the child which appears to op operate or at least most closely to operate uh, in this sphere of law is that of the unruly child, a child who is untrained and in need of control. If Locke's work may lie at the root of the developmental construct, well then criminal law's concept has much more to do with the work of Hobbes and is also clearly influenced by the Old Testament and you beat a child in order to make it good. This is an image of childhood 
which uh, has been useful to both politicians and to certain elements of the media when they wish to demonise children. Although it has to be said that practically every generation uh, decries the decline in standards of its youth. Even the Romans were appalled by the standards of the generation to come. Children taken in this sense are often viewed as thugs who must be brought into line. This quote is from a white paper, a government white paper, um, entitled No More Excuses. Young children, young people who commit offences must face up to the consequences of their actions for themselves and for others and must take responsibility for their actions. No young person should be allowed to feel he or she can offend with impunity. Punishment is important as a means of expressing society's condemnation of unlawful behaviour and as a deterrent. Of course, at one level, that's absolutely true. However, this view of the child as, to put it simply, a thug, didn't stand alone. As we'll see, for many hundreds of years, running alongside it was a, a protective mechanism of Dolly in Capax, and I'll come to that shortly. And indeed, courts were also instructed to have regard to the welfare of a child if it was appearing in a criminal court before it. Although it has to be acknowledged that the influence of that welfare principle has uh, varied over time and has probably been overtaken now by the new principle, which is to prevent offending by young people. So, the picture that emerges of childhood in law is a complex one. The child may be seen as a thug who needs to be taught in a lesson in criminal law, a vulnerable innocent who needs to be protected in family law. And to add just one more layer of complexity, and something that's very close to Lord Judge's heart, and if you he heard, uh, heard him on Radio 4 last week, you'll understand the context. A child who appears as a witness in a case rather than as a defendant is now automatically regarded as vulnerable. It could, of course, be the same child in all of those three instances. And that leads one to question whether these different approaches can be justified. Now, I recognise, of course, that in a family proceedings, the state's interest is narrower. There will rarely be a victim whose interests needs to be taken into account. There will rarely be the issue of public safety that also needs to be considered. But as far as very young children are concerned, I'm really very far from being convinced that these considerations outweigh the interests of welfare. Which takes us to the question of how criminal law conceptualises the issue of responsibility. Our system of criminal law is built upon a fundamental moral premise that it's legitimate to hold people uh, accountable for their behaviour when they have both the capacity and the choice to do otherwise. This concept of responsibility is two-dimensional. It consists of a cognitive element, an ability to understand the law and the consequences of not acting in accordance with that law, and a volitional element as well, an ability to control one's actions. In other words, the criminal law addresses itself to responsible subjects. If someone lacks capacity or the ability to conform to the law, he or she cannot be said to be a responsible actor and should not be subject to criminal sanctions. This would be true of very young children. And thus most, although not all, jurisdictions have a fixed age 
below which children as a category are exempt from criminal responsibility. And as we're now moving to the age of criminal responsibility, there we have an image of a very young offender. The fixed age that England and Wales has adopted is 10. This has been the case since 1963, which raised it from 8 um, and originally at common law the age of criminal responsibility was as low as 7. In Northern Ireland the age of criminal responsibility is 10 although the government there is considering the uh, a report, uh, the results of an independent commission that was set up by the Justice Minister there which has recommended raising the age of criminal responsibility to 12. In Scotland, the age of criminal responsibility is still eight, but as a result of legislation in 2010, no child can be prosecuted below the age of 12. They may be subject to a children's hearing instead. Ireland raised the age of criminal responsibility to 12 in 2006. Ireland's reform is of particular interest given the bill that's currently going through England and Wales um, Parliament, and I'll come back to it shortly. The average age at which criminal responsibility is imposed in Europe is 14. In Scandinavia, the average is 15. Now, running alongside the fixed age of criminal responsibility below which a child cannot be brought before a criminal court is, or was, I should say, a further protective mechanism, or to use the words from one of the most important cases see in the DPP, a benevolent safeguard. This had been in place since around the time of Edward III, and some have traced its origins further back than that the presumption of Dolly in Capax. In other words, there was a presumption that the child was incapable of evil, <coughs> incapable of doing wrong, and in order for a criminal trial to proceed, there had to be cogent evidence that the child was not Dolly in Capax. This presumption operated between the minimum age of criminal responsibility <coughs> and the upper age of the 14th birthday. The test that was developed over many years in the courts was that the child had to know that what he or she was doing was seriously wrong and not merely naughty. There were undoubtedly problems with this test. The most fundamental, from my point of view, was that this test seemed to equate knowledge of right and wrong with being Dolly Capax. Even a seven-year-old child has a basic grasp of the knowledge of right and wrong. An understanding of such concepts uh, for the consequences of oneself, of behaving in a way that uh, in, uh, is against the criminal law, the consequences for others of behaving in this way, might be deemed to be a more appropriate moral starting point for moral responsibility. But even if an understanding of right and wrong were required, however, the second aspect of responsibility an ability to control one's behaviour in accordance with the law would still be absent. The volitional element would still be absent. So as a yardstick of moral responsibility, the test was flawed. But it was important. It was 
a crude acknowledgement that children develop at different rates. Paradoxically, just as more evidence was being gathered from research about children's intellectual and psychological development, which highlights, as I'll hope to show shortly, the very significant differences in thought processes between a 10-year-old and a 13, 14-year-old. The presumption came under increasing fire. It was described as an outworn mode of thought in 1972 by the Law Commission and then outdated and unprincipled in the leading case in 1994 of C and the DPP. It's actually really difficult to know how many children were saved from prosecution as a result of the existence of the presumption of Dolly and Copax. The consultation and debate which preceded its abolition in 1998 as part of an approach which viewed children who offend as adults in everything but years was not, the government acknowledged, based upon any empirical evidence as to how the presumption had operated. Some commentators have concluded that, particularly towards the end of the presumption's existence, very few children were not prosecuted as a result of the operation of the presumption. But what we do know is that the numbers of children under 14 who were prosecuted for indictable offences increased by over 25% in the year that followed the abolition of the presumption and has continued to rise thereafter. In 2010, the all-party parliamentary group for children said that there had been an 87% increase since 1998 in the number of under 14-year-olds who were prosecuted. Now, that may be the result of the abolition of the presumption, but there were certainly many other punitive measures being introduced at the time which could have played their part. So, in an era of no more excuses, the title of the white paper which preceded the 1998 Act which abolished the presumption, children aged 10 are now fully liable to be prosecuted for their offences. The justification being Sorry, there we are. Um, the justification being that a new balance had to be struck between the sometimes conflicting interests of welfare and punishment. First and foremost, youth crime resents, represents acts against other members of the community. Young offenders need to be held to account for their actions. Nevertheless, a young person caught committing a crime must be challenged and a sanction applied. I've written elsewhere about the difficulties that I see in this approach. Underpinning this approach to criminal responsibility of children is, in fact, turning responsibility on its head. Rather than the criminal law speaking to responsible subjects, it's actually being used to make people responsible. And that I think, is a manipulation of the way in which the criminal law should be used. Now, it is true, of course, that um, there are mechanisms to divert children from the courts. For example, we have a brand new, brand new system of youth ca uh, cautions, and we have referral orders. And it's also the case that if the offence is not a serious one, that a child will be tried in the youth court 
and if convicted that there are special provisions in relation to sentencing, dependent upon the age of the child. But none of those measures alter the basic fact of responsibility. And it is still the case, regrettably, that a child who is charged with a serious offence will face trial in the Crown Court with the full majesty of the law being brought to bear, with few concessions <coughs> to the age of the child. So, against that, the bill which is... Um, currently before Parliament, represents an important opportunity to change. Lord Delacchia's bill is not the first such attempt in this jurisdiction to raise the age of criminal responsibility. Back in 1969, the Children and Young Persons Act, which marked the high watermark of the welfare approach to children in trouble, would have increased the age of criminal responsibility to 14. However, although that provision made it as far as a statute book following a change in government, it was never implemented and was eventually repealed in 1991. Lord Delacchia's private member's bill received its second reading just last month. It's perhaps remarkable that in the current climate, any parliamentary time has been found for it. But the debate, it has to be said, was remarkably short at just over an hour on a Friday afternoon. It's a very short bill. There's one clause. And in introducing it, Lord de Lacchia made it very clear why he was supporting this bill. He then went further and supported his proposal to change the law upon the substantial evidence that now exists about children's neurodevelopment, um, neurodevelopmental processes. He says, there is now a significant body of research evidence that early adolescence is a period of marked neurodevelopmental immaturity, during which children's capacity is not equivalent to that of an older adolescent or adult. Such findings cast doubt on the culpability and competency of early adolescents to participate in the criminal process. Indeed, the research is now substantial. Farmer, who is a clinical psychologist, says, over the last two decades, considerable progress has been made in mapping the neuropsychological and social development of children and adolescents. Children aged 10 and 11 are most definitely not competent to participate effectively in the legal system. And so she supports an initial increase to the age of 12 with a subsequent review to increase it further. The Royal College of Psychiatrists has also concluded that the age of criminal responsibility is too low. And a very recent report by the Royal Society, after examining the neuroscientific evidence, stated, it's clear that at the age of 10, the brain is developmentally immature and continues to undergo important changes linked to regulating one's own behaviour. <coughs> Children aged 10 not only may have difficulty thinking through the consequences of their behaviour, thereby lacking cognitive responsibility, but they are also impressionable and suggestible and may thus be easily led, so may lack volitional responsibility. Without taking any other considerations into account, such as welfare or indeed rights, and I could have built this lecture around a platform of rights, but um, that would probably have taken us even longer to develop the topic. Um, but without even drawing upon the issues of autonomy rights, 
this would seem to suggest that the case for reform is compelling. But not, it seems, to successive governments. In response to Lord de Lacchia's opening statement, Lord Ahmed articulated the view of the current administration thus. The government currently have no plans to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 10 to 12. We believe that children aged 10 and above are able to differentiate between bad behaviour and serious wrongdoing and should therefore be accountable for their actions. When a young person has committed an offence, it is important that they understand that this is a serious matter and will be dealt with as such. The public must also have confidence in the youth justice system and know that offending will be dealt with effectively. We are aware that offences committed by young people may have a devastating effect on both victims and the wider community. And it would be wrong to ignore this. The tragic case of Jamie Bulger immediately comes to mind in this context. He then goes on. Maintaining the age of criminal responsibility at 10 also enables offenders to be identified at an early age and allows multi-agency youth offending teams to become involved with the aim of putting interventions in place to address the child's behaviour. So instead of a considered reflection upon the developmental evidence, which it seems it's entirely legitimate for governments to ignore, we have the assertion of belief that children are responsible, together with a recollection of the killing by Thompson and Venables of James Bulger and the near moral panic which accompanied it. The shadow cast by that terrible event is long indeed. We also have the often cited argument that early identification may trigger positive intervention. No mention is made of the fact that early criminalisation can exacerbate a situation, nor that the alternative to criminalisation is not doing nothing. In the face of this, one ought perhaps to be relieved that the government has not counter-argued for a reduction in the age of criminal responsibility. Now, in case that's thought to be too fanciful, that was exactly the argument advanced in Northern Ireland when the justice minister there suggested, uh, uh, indicated that he was minded to accept the proposal to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12 in that jurisdiction. Given the opposition of the government, the chances of sufficient parliamentary time being found, especially in the House of Commons, to debate Lord de Callier's bill and of this small step in the right direction ever becoming law appear to be very slight. One would need a small miracle for it to succeed. However, Lord de Callier has stated in debate that when his bill goes through committee <laughs> stage, he would be prepared to consider a similar caveat to that which accompanied Ireland's reform. Presumably he sees this as a way in which there's an increased chance of the, of the bill becoming law. In 2006, when Ireland increased the age of criminal responsibility from 10 to 12, it did so with a notable qualification. The age of criminal responsibility for murder, manslaughter, rape or aggravated sexual assault remained at 10. The Centre for Social Justice, set up by Ian Duncan Smith, has made a similar proposal. It recommended that in the short term the age of criminal responsibility should be raised to 12 but for all but the most serious offences, with a blanket increase to 12 as soon as it is feasible, and I think that it means politically feasible, 
to do so. There is no principled basis for this qualification. But if this is the price that has to be paid to ensure that politicians concerned with how the public or certain sections of the media will react, that they'll support the reform, it's a very, very substantial concession. Without going into detail of our position in relation to international rights, England and Wales would still not be fully compliant with even the absolute minimum of 12 advised by the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child. And unless the law changes, we would still have the invidious spectacle of 10 and 11-year-olds being tried in the Crown Court. So, how can we move it forward? Discussions concerning children's harmful behaviour can often be very emotive and they reveal deeply polarised views. They're often based upon false constructions of a child as either an angel or a devil. In truth, they're neither or both, depending on the point at which you're dealing with them. Um, and I accept that inconsistencies between criminal law, and I should say that some of my family, in fact, my three children are here this evening, um, that inconsistencies between criminal law and family law are not, per se, unjustifiable. It's been said that the search for a single test of competency is a search for a holy grail. But there do have to be sound reasons for the differences that exist. At the very least, the differences in the tests that I've explored here between family law and criminal law reflect an ambivalence in societal attitudes to children with the criminal justice system as the site of probably the greatest tension. <coughs> Over the last few decades, government after government has increased the accountability of children for their harmful behaviour. And this pattern looks set to continue. Indeed, <laughs> currently going through Parliament, there's another bill, a government-sponsored <laughs> bill, and one that looks set to become law. This bill, with what has been described as breathtakingly wide provisions, will introduce injunctions to prevent nuisance and annoyance to replace ASBOs. I just wonder how many people in this room can say they've never annoyed or been a nuisance to people. And yet, we know that ASBOs have been used disproportionately against children and there is every risk that they will be used. The IPNUS, which will replace it, will be used disproportionately against children as well. That is the climate in which this private member's bill is struggling to make its way through Parliament. Uh, an era in which the risk of even normal childhood behaviour being dealt with as something that has to be stopped. So against this context, it has to be said that the chances of even modest reform to the age of criminal responsibility are not high. And this is so despite the fact that the age of 10 was set in 1963 with no clear or evidenced rationale. And that the Law Commission has recently concluded that it's not founded on any logical or principled basis. The abolition of the presumption of Dolly in k and the repeated assertion that children are responsible enough to stand trial in a criminal court could well be described as willful political blindness. 
at least in public, if one has a private discussion with members of the government, one often hears really quite a different response. Here we have a law that's been condemned as unsafe, unsatisfactory and harmful to wider society. It's indefensible, in my view, and repeating Lord Talakia's words, that a child is criminally responsible at 10, but is not deemed mature enough to buy a pet <coughs> until he or she is seven, 16. And that was raised from 12 only a few years ago. Unless reform happens, children will still be prosecuted for offences committed when they are of a primary school age. Admittedly, that number is not large. In 2012, for example, just over 260 children aged 10 and 11 were proceeded against in court. However, behind that figure is 10 times that number, 2,600 children who were dealt with by means of out-of-court disposals. The fact that there are only 260 children a year coming before a criminal court aged when they're 10 or 11 shouldn't lead us to conclude that the issue is a trivial one and it's not really worth worrying about. Instead, it should lead us to the conclusion that unlike the rhetoric which accompanied <coughs> potential reform in uh, Northern Ireland, that it would lead to anarchy, that anarchy is unlikely to result from a change in the law. I haven't heard tales of emanating from south of the border, from Ireland, that children are now running amok as a consequence of the age being raised to 12. In fact, there is evidence that countries with higher minimum ages of criminal responsibility do not have higher rates of offending. This all adds up to a powerful case for raising the age of criminal responsibility so that children are not deemed responsible in law before they have capacity and control. 12 would be a step in the right direction. If we could achieve this, then we could also have a debate about further increases based not only upon questions of capacity and control, but also upon broader questions of policy. A civilised system of youth justice might conclude that it's still not appropriate to invoke the criminal law in response to criminal behaviour of a child of, say, 14 or 15. This would be at the heart of why Scandinavian countries have a higher age of criminal responsibility still. It's not the case that they're saying their children are so much less mature than English children that they have to be protected by a higher age level. It is because as a matter of policy, the decision has been taken that it is not appropriate to bring children into court at that age. And although I said I wasn't going to develop this argument in terms of rights, I can't resist introducing at this point a reference to the official commentary to the United Nations minimum standards for the administration of justice. In this commentary, it says, in general, there is a close relationship between the notion of responsibility for criminal behavior and other social rights and responsibilities, such as, for example, the age of consent or civil majority. If we took that seriously, the age of criminal responsibility would need to increase to 16 or 18. As matters stand, we're in a political arms race in being tough. Politically naive it may be, but sometimes law does have to endeavour to shape 
opinion. And courage is needed here. The sort of courage that Lord Talia is exhibiting in trying to push his bill through Parliament. It provides us with a golden opportunity to change direction and enables us to have an approach which is based upon both principle and evidence. So that if the children I mentioned at the start of my lecture were permitted by their parents to go into Brighton, and if things went badly, that those 10-year-olds or 11-year-olds, or even, dare I say it, 12-year-olds would not find themselves facing a criminal trial as a consequence of their behaviour. Thank you very much.